today we're going to go through where to start, how to start, and the mentality of starting. So there's a lot to factor in when you're making a game plan um, for where to start, and it can actually be a really hard decision to make because the start plays such a major role in how you set up the rest of your race. Um, so we talk a lot about what the conditions are, and for those of you who were with us last week, um, this will be just a little bit of a refresher, but um, you know, we talk a lot about what kind of conditions there are. So if it's a puffy shifty day, the priority is to start in the most amount of pressure on the race course and start in phase. Um, if there's somewhere to race to, like the left has a lot more pressure because there's land over there, having a, a really clear lane or maybe starting towards that end of the line is, is a priority. Whereas if you have like a, an open race course and there's nothing really obvious, then you would um, maybe start um, with the bias or in a less trafficked area. Um, we talk a lot about the density of the starting line when we're approaching our start. Um, if there's a, the, a really big pin favor, but it's really packed, so it's really high density, then we'll maybe reconsider where to start. So there's, yeah, there's a lot of decisions that go into this and um, when in doubt, or you know, if there's nothing obvious or if it's an open race course, start in a place to be able to go straight and take the bias if you can. And I just want to add a quick side note there. Like, it's funny on the days that um, the, the breeze is steady and the line is square and it's not obvious which way we're going. It's kind of a funny, we're like, well, we're not really sure what to do. And you have to remember that like a lot of other people are thinking that and it's always a good plan to just have a good start with space to sail straight and do what you want. Um, yeah. So, okay. But if the line is skewed, uh, I just want to talk about, we keep saying line bias and sometimes people, two people would say like line skew or whatever it might be committee vote favored, but we're just talking about the moments that the wind is not perpendicular, exactly 90 degree perpendicular to the starting line. Um, which I think you guys often sail on really shifty inland lakes and that's probably like, it probably changes 10 times throughout the course of a sequence. Um, but we're basically asking ourselves, which is more upwind? Um, and, and how big is that bias? Because the shorter the starting line is, the less that line bias matters. The longer it is, the more difference it makes. So if you have a 100 bolt length line and five degrees of bias, that's really significant. Whereas if you have like a 10 bolt length line and five degrees of bias, um, it's not really enough to outweigh other factors that you're considering. Yeah, a couple of notes about the line bias also is that uh, when it's really shifty, that bias is changing a lot throughout the sequence. Um, so being in tune with the shifts and how frequently they're changing will also kind of give you an indicator of like how late you need to make your game plan or how committed you need to be to it, right? So um, if it's changing a lot, then you might kind of hang back and go for a later approach. You might have like the no plan plan, um, but if it's not changing a lot, then you can kind of rely on the bias. And if it hasn't shifted, then, you know, even if you're start finishing through the same starting line, you can, it's that reliable if it's not very shifty. Um, so how do you check the, lie, the bias? So I want to talk about that. Um, on our boat, we keep it really simple. We basically, go to where we think is the middle of the line. We put the boat head to wind. Um, Steph checks the windex at the top of the rig, make sure that's pointing into the wind. She keeps an eye on the jib, make sure that's in the boat end of the wind. And she'll tell me, mark, 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 when at the moments that the bow is like directly into the wind. Um, and that's a really big deal because if the bow's off by five or 10 degrees, then your line bias reading is all of a sudden pretty far off. So that's a kind of a skill that is really important. And to share one of her tricks in our boat, it's, it's pretty nice to like go backwards and a lot, and then you at least have like flow over the rudder. Um, but I'll let her talk about that a little bit later. Um, but so basically going head to wind and then I stick my head between the chain plates, which is where the shroud's attached to the deck. Um, that's a really good like line between those two objects is definitely perpendicular to the center line of our boat, which should be in theory in line with the windex when we're head to wind. And so I look out from those two points and sometimes I'll put my arms out like this. You probably can't see cause I'm in a, <laughs> sorry, in a webinar. Um, you put your line, your, your imaginary arms out forever. And that line extends um, through the chain plate. And if I'm looking up at the committee boat, if the committee boat's above that line, then we're committee boat favored. If the committee boat's below that line, then I check out the pin, okay? So if the pin is above my, you know, sight out through the port side of the boat, then the pin's favored and vice versa. Um, yeah, I like to use those chain plates because it's like a really good reference point. Whereas if you just sit in the middle of the boat and stick your arms out, you have to be sure that like you are actually properly perpendicular to the boat and you want to do it in the same place every time. Um, so that's one really fancy, highly technical scientific way. You just look at 90 degrees from your boat and judge it based off that. Um, but there's another way that I'll let Steph talk about the compass because she's a numbers gal. <laughs> uh, yeah, can we go to the next slide? Yep. Cool. So we 
yeah, like many said, we have a couple of different ways of doing this. Another way is to um, sail away from the committee boat end on starboard and um, line up your forestay with the pin end and then line up your rudder with the um, committee boat end of the starting line. So you can see um, on the right here, the boat is um, reaching away from the race committee boat. And as soon as they have things lined up, I'll say, mark, mark, mark. And then Maggie will give me a compass reading. And you can see here, our line is conveniently set, square, set to zero. So that means square to that starting line is 90 degrees. Um, we'll then sail down to the middle of the line. And one thing we'll do while we're on our way down to the middle of the line is just get a feel for what it feels like to be on the starting line. And that as you get farther away from the ends, that becomes harder and harder. So having a good feel for what it feels like to be on the line is a really important part of our process. So as we get down towards the middle of the line, we'll go head to wind. Um, and like Maggie said, we'll use the Windex or the jib flapping to give us an idea of where we are head to wind. And Maggie will take her quick shout readings. Um, and then we'll do our, our, head, our compass number as well. So here, um, our head to wind was 85 degrees. So you can see here that we have a five degree pin favor. Um, and you know, something to think about is that you know, being on lake sailing, the, the bias is constantly changing. So this is something really important to keep your eye on um, throughout the um, starting sequence. And I'm gonna let Steph elaborate on um, how the length of the line or the distance you are to objects affects the, the, uh, the amount of bias that you get. Yeah, so like Maggie said, like a lot of times we end up just eyeballing our, our, um, our bias and Here's just, an, here's just a chart um, from Speed and, Spart, Speed and Smarts where you can really um, visualize the penalty that you have for, if you have a really long line and a big bias, um, the penalty for starting on the wrong side of the line is quite big. Um, and this also applies to shifts as well. So being on the wrong side of a shift or the wrong side of the line can be a really big penalty. Okay, so to simplify things, um, we like to divide the line into thirds. Uh, sometimes if you're racing in really big fleets, um, it's, you're racing the boats around you. You know, if there are like 30 boats on a line, for example, um, what matters is like the five or 10 boats nearest you. So we, now we kind of want to zoom in uh, to the small picture of like what third you're on. Um, and what type of data is really influences uh, your urgency to either be the boat that's closest to the committee boat or the boat that's closest to the pin versus saying we can be in the windward pack or I want to be on the hip of the boat of the pack that's at the pin. Um, and, uh, you know, to, to take that to the next step. So say it's a really like steady day, kind of like the one that we showed you in the beginning that you had to win the left. There's a huge advantage to being the boat at the pin, right? Even the boat that's like, um, on the hip of that boat and, and, and the hip of that boat and the hip of that boat, it's like, it's just inches and inches further away from the advantage that's being gained on the left. And so that kind of a day, it's really important to be the boat at the pit um, versus a day that it's like really shifty or puffy. Actually, you want options. So anywhere in that third, you know, you, you get the bias of the line um, by being in, in that third, you know, by being close to it. Uh, but you actually have more options by maybe setting up on the winter hip of that path. So anyhow, um, just to list a few pros and cons, basically the pin third, there's some risk associated with it because if you do have a bad start, say you drop main sheet or it's not your best acceleration, whatever happens, it happens. Um, your plan B is to tack away and you're further from clear air, which is out on that right side usually. So um, we say there's a little risk involved uh, being at the pin only because your, your exit option can be a little harder. You have to like sail through a lot of bad air before you break free to the clear air. Um, Okay, and the middle third, we think the hardest part of the map, the middle third is gauging where you are on the line. We see the biggest um, line sag, which we'll get into in just one second, uh, in the middle, obviously. And, and where that sag is can move, but generally speaking, like, when you're closer to an end, it's just easier to see where the pin is and where that flag is at the committee boat, and therefore you're more accurate when you guess. Um, the boat third we kind of think about is like the safest place to start, um, because your, your option B to tack and get clear air if something goes wrong is generally easier, right? There's like less traffic, less clutter at the boat. Um, other, other things I really like about being at the boat is timing. If your stopwatch is, you know, if you, if you were really far away when the prep signal really went off, a lot of times you can hear the countdown. Um, 
and uh, and when that's really like clear, it, it's kind of helpful. Also, sometimes when we're really pushing the line, uh, Steph will look at the PRO who's citing the line, and she'll know where he or she is looking and who they're looking at and where they're gauging from, and uh, that can sometimes help you know how much you can push the line or how much you are pushing the line. So, um, that's a tool too. You can use at either end of the line. Is is really like if you're the pinmost boat, you can really like engage the eyes of um, of the person calling the line at the pin, and that's a really really good reference.